Okay, so this is the Weaving the World Ops call on Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021. Uh, I am going to screen share, connect this to SETI because they're homophones intentionally. Uh, so there's that. And then yeah. I've got this with communicating with animals and I've got dolphin communication already under it. And I should have military dolphin stuff. I don't know. Hmm. I don't have a lot here, do I? John Lilly. So I will add some, uh, add some more here. Human buying computer isolation tanks, center for the cyclone, the order of the dolphin. I've forgotten about that. He's a he study psychedelics. So dolphins plus psychedelics, what could be wrong with that kind of a career? I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying. And I've got uh, Lily under famous LSD fans. Uh, Cary Grant, did you know that? No. Uh, Stanislav Grof, Timothy Leary, of course. R.D. Lang, Francis Crick, Dick Feynman. So? Yeah, all famous LSD fans. And Al Hubbard, the guy who kind of sewed, sewed LSD across the West back in the day. Uh, so Hubbard turned Willis Harmon onto LSD uh, from IONS, and I'm going to connect Willis Hubbard to famous LSD fans, and then I will stop sharing and pause the recording. <laughs> uh, so fun digression uh, complete. Uh, I so I was interested in kind of co-working to do some of the standing up, some of the episode. I haven't replied to. Uh, so for Stacy and Hank, um, I sent an email to uh, Ken Homer saying, hey, uh, Pete had a very good idea, which was let's do a very short uh, Weaving the World episode, 10, 15 minutes max. And then let's do all of the moving parts that, that the episode needs to have. And so it's basically a practice run, a dry run. Uh, but that forces me to, to have an intro and an outro or an end screen on the recording or for us to step through what the, what the different phases are of, of processing the recordings. I then need to stand up the Anchor account to get a, an audio podcast started and figure out what that little process is. Probably need to get some simple art up so that there are some banners and icons. All those things are like, like things I need to do. And I'm also keeping in the back of my head what Mila advised, which was just do the simplest thing, my language, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Just start small and don't worry about not having art, for example, at the beginning, which I agree with. Um, so uh, Ken said, sounds terrific. Would be honored to hang with you all anytime. Uh, anytime that works for us all. His mornings are full, but generally after one or 2 p.m. Pacific is more open. So I'm thinking let's find a time, let, let's schedule let's find a couple of times that work for us within that window and let's i'll propose those back to ken and that'll lock down the launch date time uh and then also i want to i think i think what this also implies is uh launching the uh the mirror session or the the post processing the fungus session that matches this session because we actually need to walk through the whole process um and so i think we should also kind of book that and invite ken to it uh, because the invitation, I think, will always be open for whoever the guest guest or guests were to join the post session, the post party. Uh, it could even just be called a post party. Um, um, oh, good. From my surgic acid from ergotamine. Exactly. <laughs> the ergot fungus. Thank you. Um, so anyway, uh, does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, and I knew I had ergot and ergotamine, there we go, but I don't have ergot, ergot and ergotamine connected to LSD, which is just really strange. So I just made that link. Harry, did Daryl ever answer you back? Uh, yes. So um, Daryl Davis, one of my heroes, um, is the guy who says, how can you hate me uh, without even knowing me, um, he, I, I friended him on LinkedIn. Um, then I sent him an email invite, uh, which I don't know if it even got to him, but then I, I went back and pinged on, on LinkedIn and I said, hey, sent you an email invite, uh, trying to invite you to a podcast. And he said, yes, but I'm really busy. And we picked December 9th as a, as a date with the understanding that that date might have to wiggle around a little bit. But I, he, he was like, I'm going, my schedule frees up and I'm back home kind of early December. So we picked it, he picked December 9th. Uh, so we've got a time set 
uh, as a, a working start for when to have a call. I would love to have three or four actual full calls booked before December 9th. So he's not our first, he's not the first episode, but he's in line to, to be a, a weaving the, the world guest, which I'm thrilled about. Um, I'd, I also need to somehow send some energy toward Mila and Amber and uh, Joel, because I'd asked them, the three of them to create an emergent call. Uh, well, to create a, a call around the issues that we've been talking about. And Mila said, let's make it emergent. I was like, great. But their schedules are really messy and we haven't been, I haven't been able to pin down when that would actually happen. So kind of need to do that. Um, if, if you guys haven't seen Daryl Davis just talk about his experiences, it's completely worth it. He's, um, he's a, just a lovely soul. There's also a documentary about his work, which is really good. And I think I mentioned this in a, a check-in call long ago, but toward the end of the documentary, this just stays in my head a lot. Toward the end of the documentary, two young black male activists show up and they really don't like what Daryl is doing. They don't like that he's going and talking to the KKK. They think what you should do is other kinds of activism and fight them and all that. And they're angry at him. Uh, and the documentary is really sort of nice about showing this and I don't, I, that part of it doesn't really come to a resolution. But I just think Daryl is an incredibly brave hero because he's, 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 dissolving, he's dissolving the anger on the other side. And that to me, you know, it's like patience and respect and love are a universal solvent of sorts is what I take from his activities in the world. And that, that is actual progress. If he has, if he has 300 um, robes from KKK members, some of whom are grand dragons and senior ranking people in his garage, that's progress of some major sort, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, let me pause. Uh, thoughts about all this? Um, where's the calendar? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the calendar. Uh, and, and actually, I, um, let me be a little bit more specific. Yeah. Where's the production calendar? Uh, separately, there's the you know publication calendar for for the public. But you know, the, um, for us working on um, episodes and getting stuff ready, and you know, where do we keep that? Exactly. So I haven't created separate calendars for weaving the world yet. Um, so I think you're saying there should be. I should. I should crank up two more calendars. I. I. I, I wouldn't use it. I. I wouldn't keep it in Google Calendar. It should be in Google Sheets or Airtable or whatever. Okay. So you mean just a just a place to track. You don't mean a calendar to public. Because because one of the things I was thinking was embedding a Google Calendar on the website someplace so that people yeah. can, can see what the episodes um, are. Something that people can watch and and subscribe to. That's probably a Google Calendar, but. Um, uh, as volunteer production staff and as um, uh, head uh, chief chief uh, production staff. Sure. So let me share the let me share the, the spreadsheet that I've got going already uh, to start this, which I many several of you have seen, but not everybody. And is busy painting itself on my screen right now. Probably in there. There's also stuff you know confirmed. Uh, this is an idea that, that's in the pipeline or something like that. Yeah, and we're slotting it for February-ish. Exactly. February exactly. Um, man, this is slow. The little share screen is just busy loading with a spinning spinning wheel. There's a um, there's a new Airtable-ish clone, um, very much like Airtable actually, without without quite as much fancy stuff that Vincent would use. But it's really heartening to see it. Um, pop up and it's mostly open source. What's it called? Um, I think it's. Uh, let me let me figure it out. Okay, um, and I'm going to. Hank already has access to it. Yeah. Um, uh, C table. Uh, Stacy, you have access to it too. Let me add Pete and Wendy. And I'll try to add the right Wendy this time. How about that? Um, C table is a spin out from C cloud, I think, which is a, it's kind of like Nextcloud. It's a file oh, interesting. collaboration thing. Um, so, but it's C table is now a separate um, entity. Oh, that's really fun. C table. I would have called it Seatable, and I would have I thought know. it was a restaurant <laughs> reservation system. I'm well, like, oh, good. They're, uh, I think they're German, and I, I, 
um, I had a little problem with some of the links on their websites because they're pretty new. And yeah. so I got a nice letter back from, you know, VP of something. And I, I was pretty tempted to say, by the way, do you know in English that looks like you're talking about being able to sit down? <laughs> it's a great name for a restaurant res reservation system. And if they fail at this table thing. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I sent a, I put a link in the chat, given that you all now have access, edit access to the document that should work uh, to get you in. Oh, but they do have a capital T in the middle of C table. So it makes, yeah. Yeah, if you're, if you're careful with it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, just from my days as a tech industry analyst, I never, like if somebody's, uh, if somebody's product or company name was all caps, Unless it was actually an acronym, I would never all cap it in, in the publication. But if it had internal caps, I always obeyed that. So, so camel case, internal caps, I was like, yep, that, that's a style and thing that I, I, will, I will observe. But if you're trying to attract attention by going all caps, screw you. Anyway. <laughs> and then also, also, also another, another silly little policy. Uh, I would never, I would never honor ninety-nine cent or ninety-nine dollar pricing. So if something, if a, if a, if an offer was nine ninety-nine, I always wrote it down as a thousand dollars. Like, nope, not going there, not playing, not playing that game. Um, refuse to follow that sort of stuff. What a rebel! I know. Well, doesn't that make me like totally a rebel? Yeah, it's like that's good editorial hygiene, I think. Yeah. Um, Cool. Okay, so there's the spreadsheet, and I shouldn't have Daryl as number one. He should probably be number three or four. Uh, so let me just change that. And then um, we had spent some time, and Stacy, was it you and me um, who went through the list that starts with David Weinberger down here? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. So we sat down, um, I think last week. Uh, or week before, we sat down and looked at this list and started moving people up and down. I was explaining who these people are uh, and what the ideas were. I don't know how David ended up at the top because my attempt is not to be interviewing white men early in the process. Um, uh, but uh, David is a dear friend, runs really deep and gotta say small pieces loosely joined uh, and a bunch of other themes that he's on. Uh, he is all about sort of the, the, the direction that we're heading in. Um, and how this all works. Um, I think we had mentioned that maybe with some of those white men, the way we'd get around it was to pair them with some women. Exactly. So it'd be like speaker pairings. It'd be like, I, th I think I think Weinberger would go well with a muscat because he's kind of acerbic. So he needs like a sweet pairing. I have no idea. I don't know. Just kidding. A muscat, muscat wines, muscat grapes are very sweet. Okay. <laughs> I love Muscat grapes. Whenever I see them, I'm like, I buy Muscat grapes. They're so good. Um, so yes, totally agree. And we started to sort of uh, uh, propose some of those things. Uh, Michael, awesome to see you. I'm going to post a link to a, the, the doc that we're staring at right now in the chat and check to see whether you have editor access. I think you do. Yes. So you are already an editor on this doc. Um, and we're staring at the schedule of potential uh, uh, guests for Weaving the World. Um, also, um, Wendy Elford put these four lines in, five lines in, I think. Um, and Weaving the Weavers in particular um, is, a, is like a yes, 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 yes. Um, this, this feels to me like a, a really important thing to just keep in mind all the time. Like diverse communities around the world are already doing this kind of weaving, bring them together, take one good idea from each of them and weave these together. That um, seems to me to be like a central function of weaving the world uh, and, uh, and the post parties. Um, so let me pause for a second and ask what, what's the most fruitful way to, to collaborate on the schedule? Should I walk through the people and talk about who, why, where, and we brainstorm more names and then sort them into an order? That would be totally great. Um, or something else. Uh, in, in my experience, if you want to get something like this done quickly, uh, it's good to have a date. Uh, like not build the field and they'll come, but build the date and there's something concrete. So regarding the, uh, the let's say the, the dry run, 
we should at least have a date for that and then one or two people that we want to dry run with. Uh, so the dry run um, right now is with Ken Homer and um, and I'm and I'm I'm thinking we offer we we uh, so I'm I'm also torn about the format whether it's just Ken and me talking about issues so that it's the smallest possible unit or whether uh, we you know say hey we're starting this thing and put it out to the whole OGM community and see who shows up and and make it a a, a more vis a more open conversation which then opens the question about what is the internal format of the call. Uh, do I do I monopolize the the guest for a while and not et cetera et cetera? So yes, and uh, so Hank, my intention is to take the top four names on the list as sorted and send them notes that say you know and send them invites immediately that say could you meet and yeah. and also to meet on their convenience at their uh, on their schedule not on a yeah. fixed schedule because yeah. my my instinct is if we say that it's every Wednesday at eight a.m. Pacific, that that suddenly complicates all the scheduling for yeah. any guest because they'd yeah. be like, well, I, I I can make that time only in March next year, yeah. as a, as opposed to the soonest I can meet I can meet with you is next Tuesday. Does that work for you? Sounds yeah. great. And then we do a pop up call for OGMers around it. And I'm interested in feedback around whether to make these group calls or whether to make certainly the post parties. Certainly, the post parties are open invite to anybody to come in and weave, especially if you're a mapper and want to take a swing at mapping the conversation, all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, my, my, my inclination is to make the initial calls uh, community, like open, but I feel like I'm adding complexity that way that may make things more, uh, how do I say it, complex. Um, agreed. I, I think, I, yeah, I agreed. I think you should try to keep things really simple and then build from a, a kernel rather than trying to whittle it down from. So the then the, so then I would have a call with Ken. I would post process it some to tidy it up and make it look like an episode. I would send the that episode with an invite to the post party to every to OGM and whoever else. Uh, and they would then need to watch the original episode. Yeah. Uh, in order to participate in the post party, which is yeah. kind of then becomes a requirement. If yeah. if they if they can't be on the original original call, they'll, they'll they will probably have to watch the original call to do any post processing for the call. Which I, which then the, is like this yeah. first one. I would keep as simple as possible. Yeah. So you and Ken post processing, um, and then add just a few more people in to make the uh, the after call. So by specific invite, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Pete. Although you might consider Ken plus one person, since I think in a lot of the episodes you're going to want to have uh, two people there, so you might as well practice that. But if um, it's someone that Ken knows, it makes it easier. Right, and and on this on this, and I just picked Ken because he's been posting reviews of Graber and Warchow's new book. Yeah which I completely love and agree with. And yeah. as a topic, it is also a topic that I'm extremely happy to dive into and have a bunch of stuff already in my brain about so that the weaving will be good right from the start. And, and I don't know who else is kind of passionate in his way about it, uh, who is also not a white guy. So if we found somebody else, I'd be happy to, to invite them into that, that uh, session as well. Stacy, you had your hand up. No, I, I was just gonna suggest doing it as a fishbowl so that you know it doesn't add the complexity of other people speaking, but if they want to be present in real time, but just I just want to throw that possibility out. And and that's if, if this was a more open invite, that's the format I would probably adopt. And then the question becomes: This is an honor system fishbowl. It's like, hey, you know, if if you're in, if you're outside the bowl, uh, use the chat or do this or do that. But you know, don't jump in until the end of the call when we when we you know open the session to that or whatever. And I, I could I could certainly enforce that. But the um, it, if if I may, the way I see this this initial call, yep. um, it's really to um, kind of stress test and learn things about the production process. Um, so I, it's not really about content, and hopefully you'll have Ken for a real a real session. Um, but really anything that adds, so even, even the fishbowl thing, it's like, okay, so now there's scheduling Ken and Jerry and, you know, and oh, Ken had to, to change the thing and then I have to notify all the, you know, it's like the or, kind of or, the simplest yeah. thing to make 10 or 15 minutes of recorded video that's like, oh my God, now we have to do something with this. Um, 
is kind of what I'm thinking. So this is more like the ori original hops of the starship, uh, except we're trying yeah. not to blow up on landing. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not pick that metaphor again. <laughs> no? It's actually a really good one. That um, It's a superlative uh, agile, uh, agile demonstration. I was I was just so freaking impressed with their openness and willingness to instrument this thing and show everybody. It's hey, look, amazing. We, we tried to stick the landing and we blew it up on the pad and this is what we learned from it. And like, look, we're, we have another one next freaking week. And you're like, how, right? And, and the, you know, the, the previous Agile demonstrations, it's like, oh, look, Spotify, you know, uses Agile teams to implement features and stuff like that. You know, when you can point to a video of a massive rocket made of stainless steel crashing and literally exploding and burning, you know, it's like, it's okay, throw them away, you know, just keep learning. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and they start simple and then they, they start adding components. Very impressive. Um, totally impressive, yes? Um, I, I have a, so part of, I think that part of the production process, a big part of the production process, I think is the script. Um, I think that uh, the script is fun and easy to start to learn and uh, it may be hard and um, take a lot of concentration to do it well. Um, I think the way I see that, Jerry, I don't, I don't think that becoming a descript maestro is not the thing that I would put on your plate. Um, and I have, so, and, and the, 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 the small grant for a couple months of effort from the Jim Rupp Foundation includes some money for production, which I haven't really used at all. I haven't, and, and I talked with Jim Rutt's podcast producer, who was happy to help and gave me an hourly rate that he'd be available for. Um, and so we could also, I could hire somebody who's good at Descript or pay somebody who loves Descript and wants to get good at it to do that. The only question in there is, there's a lot of tight, close-in editing that you can do in Descript that I may want to be involved in at least. I, I think you should be involved. Um, I, but but the lesson for me is um, that sounds like something you want to pair pair with somebody. Right. Um, so and this is a little bit like the, a, this is a little bit like the saying in the breakfast of bacon and eggs: the chicken is involved, but the pig is committed. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know why I like that so much. But. <laughs> It's a good one. Funny. Um, so the way I would set it up is, is somebody's kind of driving the script and you're watching over their shoulder on screen share and you're going, oh, that's the sentence, you know, that's the gold one or yeah. That sounds okay awesome. All those things or uh, Pete and I were on a call yesterday where at the beginning of the call, one of our friends mentioned a, pl a, a Zoom plugin that is a note-taking, AI note-taking plugin. Then I went and looked at that and there's like a half dozen of these things that are sprouting in the landscape that do full, not only full transcript, but then all, a bunch of these other things. And, and because these things are so young, they're not charging yet. So who knows what fees they'll end up on, but they're kind of free to try. So I, I was like, it seemed very tempting, but then the moment we start using a proprietary whatever, to, as, as part, which includes the script, by the way, as part of our flow, we're suddenly breaking a little bit of our rules. Um, but so, you know, we're looking at using platforms like Descript and Zapier and a couple other things uh, as elements in our work, in our production flow. Um, but, but there's newer and smarter tools just like popping up in the field all the time. It's really interesting, uh, including the video, the preview video for this tool uh, basically shows uh, during the live transcript of the call, you can highlight a phrase and turn that into a to-do item for yourself. Uh, you know, you can basically you can basically harness what's happening during the call to go leave action notes. I think leave bookmarks in the call, uh, a bunch of other stuff. It sounded really quite cool. What what's the rule that you're breaking? Just to make it um, to to use open source everything and to leave our data in you know openly in the world and all that. So um, so if if Pete writes a script that goes from A to B to C, he can write it in a language that is basically code that we leave on GitHub that anybody else can then go fork and use for free. Um, that's great. If we start using Zapier or some other kind of online service or Descript, then they must go get a, an account and very likely pay for it. And who knows? And we have no control over what that service does internally, right? How it changes and what it does over time. Thank you. In, yep. Into that, um, this is something that I, I run into in multiple communities. Um, and there's, I, I, I'm thinking of it kind of a, of a hierarchy of, a, you know, hier hierarchy is maybe not the right word or 
gradual levels or something like that. But um, the ideal thing is open source, um, open data formats. Um, and then and then there's a few more things, and I probably won't think of them in order, but one of the things is um, maybe the service uh, isn't open source, but they offer you know a very generous free tier or they have a community edition or something like that. So um, uh, diagrams.net is something like that where uh, it's not open source, but they've kind of committed to make it, you know, they, they seem to commit to making it free forever. And they're very good with the, the, the data format. It's an open data format, things like that. Um, and then um, maybe there's something that's even more proprietary, but the data format is still importable, exportable. So maybe Airtable is like that. They've got a pretty good free tier. Um, uh, you bump into the, the paid tier a little bit sometimes, especially when you get long tables and stuff like that. But um, their import export is really good. So they've got good connectivity to API stuff. The, so then the, the, you know, the thing that you don't want is something that's highly proprietary, costs a lot of money, um, and is really hard to get your data out of, right? Um, uh, and somewhere in there, actually, by the way, so Miro is kind of a good, bad thing for me. Um, uh, Miro, yeah. because of, you know, because of the flexibility and the, and the stuff, um, you can, it's expressive, it's very expressive. But if you do a lot of the fancy stuff in Miro, um, it's hard to get the data out. Um, they are nice enough to make sure that you can get, you know, I, I, I ended up exporting a Miro board recently, so I, I had some experience. Um, uh, you, can, you can export uh, like the text and you know what objects have what, but if you start having composed objects with multiple text fields in them, you're not gonna get them in order and things like that, or you may not get them, you may get all of the text items for a bunch of things rather than piece parts. So. There's, there's kind of a scale of data complexity and data interoperability that massive wiki is on really one end where it's super you know super interoperable and another one where it's super proprietary Miro is one of those things that's um, even though they let you get the data it's it's not as useful anymore it's, once you try to get I it out I think the mirror problem is a little bit like the brain problem, which is you can kind of get exactly. the data out, but there's no other tool that absorbs it and presents it the same way. So yeah. you've got a bag of objects. Yeah. Um, a small side note on diagrams.net, uh, which may interest you, Wendy, um, which is um, that, uh, and I, I think I sent you a edit privileges uh, note at the beginning of this call so that you have access to the spreadsheet. So if you check your email, you might might actually have that. If it doesn't, if it isn't, I'll, I'll check again and send again. Um, but diagrams.net does layers, which is really nice. So Pete and I spent a little time yesterday uh, redrawing the multi-layer, uh, multi-plane camera mosaic view uh, that I drew by hand in diagrams.net. And we're not done, but I think that's going to be super useful. Uh, Wendy, do you not have it? Shall I try again? Okay, I will, I will try again. Second thing is I'm realizing that we're near the top of the hour. Hank, uh, Hank and I are in a positive cartography session in an hour and somebody's going to join here in my Zoom at the top of this hour as a sort of how getting to know you kind of call for that. So we kind of have like eight minutes left in, in this conversation, I'm afraid, sorry about that. But thank you for your, your, your time on this. And let me go fix that with the spreadsheet. Um, so well, that's what I did. <laughs> um, I was just uh, thinking about the the road to participation, um, and you know how I agree with Pete. You know things want to start off really simple, technically and logistically, um, but you know maybe there. Could be some initial participation from invited OGM users or guest invitees that would yield, you know, some people listening to maybe the pre-production version of the podcast, asking some questions that you would curate. And then for starters, they might just be show notes or something written, but, you know, eventually they could be 
the equivalent of when you go to an event and people are asking questions in the questions channel and then the moderator is able to like collect them and ask them at the end or make them ultimately part of the, the process. But the idea of having um, participation that goes beyond um, you and a guest seems like something to ease into in a gradual way. Um, yes, and I, I was half distracted. Wendy, I sent it to your everyone's wisdom account. Uh, do you have a, Google, a Gmail account that I should send it to instead? I don't have that. If you could put that in the chat, that'd be great. Um, and, I'll, and I'll double down on that. Um, so Michael, you were saying other people could be involved and I missed exactly the, the detail of when they were like, at what point? Well, I was, I was you know, suggesting that it could be a, a gradual process that to keep things simple to start off with, let's take you and Ken, you know, you record something, um, you have a select group of people listen to it and come up with some questions that you then give to Ken and they yield some written Q and A, audience Q and A answers. And that's as far as that goes. But then later it could happen in increasingly real time. Uh, and it just would be a way to dry run the idea of participation in an asynchronous way that's more manageable. So um, a variant on that maybe, because I think what I need to also do is, is I need to figure out how to craft invites to the calls, <clears throat> right? I think part of, the, part of the workflow is going to be um, <clears throat> an announcement of a call coming up. Uh, and that partly depends on whether the initial call is just me, just a two-person interview or a three-person interview, uh, et cetera. But once it becomes a, a broader event, and I'm, I'm writing invites to them. And the invite could point to a wiki page <clears throat> uh, where people could pose preliminary questions or other kinds of things like you just described. And then that becomes an artifact in our whole workflow. Um, and we can kind of, you know, mine from those questions as we like, as opposed to people sending me individual emails or, or whatever else, we can kind of do this in the, in the public space as well. I like that. Um, Wendy, you should have an email to your Gmail account uh, to get you into the doc. Um, yeah, and then I'm making changes. Yes, excellent. Um, and feel free to add names. And if you uh, if you want, let's create a field that says who recommended this name or something like that, so we know who, what, where. Uh, I'm happy to talk about the people on the list if anybody is interested. Um, and really open to new ideas for. Uh, where to go in the couple of minutes we have left. And I think Angel Acosta, I think Angel Acosta would be a really good early guest. Um, I was a guest on his podcast for the Garrison Foundation. Um, and one of the, the, the lovely things about that conversation was that he slowed us down by doing a breath meditation kind of in the middle of it, which was really nice because I probably kind of need people to slow us down. Oh, good, Jenny's here. Um, and um, trying to figure out, you know, how that works. So I, I'm, I'm tempted to send Angel an invite for an early, uh, early conversation. Jenny, hi, you're, you're, you're coming to the end of our, our uh, earlier call. You're welcome to be here. Uh, happy to have you meet everybody. Um, oh, I always like to meet new people. Yes, I was very surprised. I said, who are these people? What's going on? Who are these on? people? Yeah, yeah. This is a busy room. <laughs> um, uh, so we're right, we're, um, uh, we're standing up a new podcast called Weaving the World. This is a standing call every Wednesday morning call, uh, which is the Weaving the World operations call. And we've been talking through whom to invite and when, uh, how to do a short test call up front. What does that mean? Uh, what are the formats? What are the work? What are the moving parts? Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. And these are all superheroes on the call. <laughs> okay. Jerry, um, one, one thought that I had as you were talking about, um, uh, you know, people having discussions, having more than one person on the show, um, I wonder if 
in, in, the, in the spirit of, of weaving the idea of having almost a, a format of, well, while you're the host, the conversation that you guide might be between two people who you pick out for you know their interesting potential interaction on a subject um so that you it it ups your chances of of you know diversifying your your guests and 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 maybe having some provocative other people who you wouldn't want to have on solo to give the megaphone to necessarily, which is sort of an endorsement. But if you're having two people with slightly different takes on a subject, um, it just could be an interesting thing to kind of work work the weaving toward. Um, and I'm uh, so I just last week um, did some story threading, which is very related here. Um, of a conference called Unfinished 2021. Uh, I, these are the story threads that I did. So I story threaded a conversation between <clears throat> uh, Tracy Ryans and Aaron Solomon. Here is, here is whenever, the, whenever the permalink for their conversation shows up from the conference organizers, which should be a couple of weeks from now, I will add that to this thought. And then here's how I curated that conversation. Now I was not anywhere near their original interview. It was shot, you know, uh, uh, elsewhere, and I got to just watch that session. And then these are th this is my note taking from that. And then I created this video, uh, and I'll, I'll send you guys a link to the the unifying thought so you can watch all these if you want to, uh, because the videos that I put up on YouTube right now are unlisted. But as soon as this all kind of opens up, I'm gonna just make them public. No big deal. Um, but I've kind of done a piece of that recently without me involved in the original interviews. And I'm wondering what, I'm wondering what a good balance here is because in part, this let me hit pause all the time. And I was kind of doing call and post call simultaneously because I would pause and go do a bunch of stuff and then come back and, and pick up and listen, you know, listen to the session, which was totally fun and fine. It took a, it took quite a while, you know, so, so this is like a, 45 or 50 minute interview that probably took me three hours to, to story thread, not counting recording the video afterward, um, right? Um, and, and a bunch of this stuff I had in Ayat Khan in my brain. Uh, so it was really, really easy to just draw a link between him and, him and the call. Uh, but then, then I started looking around here going, oh, right, he's the dad of the Naya de Ayat Khan, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't have Shikantaza which is a kind of silent meditation, but I did have the Kaodong school and Soto meditation and Zazen. So I made those links and I was busy like improving my brain as I, as I, did, this, as I did the story threading, none of which shows up in my story threading. Oops, there goes my brain. Let me stop sharing and restart my brain. Um, so anyway, uh, that's what was happening. And we've just uh, passed the top of the hour. Um, but I'm very interested in some of the nuances here of, of how this works. Also because my tendency is to run pretty fast and to talk quickly and do a bunch of stuff at once and be all excited. And I'm not sure that's going to help in this situation. I think being more considered in the pace will help a bunch in making things uh, on, the, on the one hand easier to process and weave. <clears throat> and on the other hand, uh, not whipping past important questions or issues. So all thoughts welcome. And uh, we should probably uh, uh, melt this call and uh, Hank and Jenny and I can shift into the, the next call, but um, feel free to add anything to the spreadsheet. Um, and we've got a Weaving the World Ops channel on Mattermost also for, for this conversation, so. Does that make sense? Awesome. Rockin'. Thank you so much. Bloop, 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 bloop. Um, cool. Jenny, nice to meet you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, Hank, do you want to?
Yeah, okay. Um, we had a two hour conversation during the, the positive cartography mapathon with all kinds of old folks. Uh, sorry, Jerry, if I include you with the old folks. I'm an old We're supposed to have young people who never showed up. So that was, of course, one of the conversational uh, themes of it. But another uh, rather interesting conversational theme was this idea of stocks and flows. Uh, I think the context was, uh, or the original context was, there's so much information coming at us, data, knowledge, opinions uh, uh, from all kinds of media. And uh, some of that might be stocks, but most of it is flows. And how do you know what's a stock and what's a flow? Or how do you shift from one to the other? Uh, and I think there were several other ways we thought about the relevance of stocks and flows. One thought that I kept from that conversation was Leif Edvinson saying, we should become curators of the upstream. Uh, and uh, Jenny, after the call, was quite interested in that theme. And uh, she went off for some time to uh, France after that. I was in Germany after that. But now that we're both back.